I can imagine for other people, but it's hard to see, even though you can imagine, what people wrestle with in today's world. Some wrestle with not having a house to live in. Some wrestle with addiction. Some people wrestle with medical issues, mental health issues. Life is full of turmoil, and it's full of loss. Sometimes it's full of insecurity. Sometimes it's full of fear and terror. You don't have to look very far today to see all of those things. The causes are frequently on TV right now. We have politicians calling each other names, using underhanded means that no one would have dreamed of 40 years ago. And we're being mesmerized by words. And in this world, where is your hope? Is it in Bernie Sanders? Is it in Donald Trump? <laughs> I deliberately did not do that. I was trying very hard. It is, and I have to acknowledge Deborah's uh, disposition on this, it is with total incredulous humor that I look at all the politicians that are trying to get our votes now. And how much more could the world need hope than what it needs today? Now, we have a name for our church, New Hope Christian Fellowship, and we have a catchphrase. The catchphrase was put on the table by one of our pseudo foster kids, Elric, and the phrase is new beginnings, new endings, new hope. Now I had somebody ask me, what does that mean? And the second question I asked was, why would you not understand the conceptual value of that name? And it turned out this person was not used to going and seeking the hope in the moment. They were used to wrestling with adversity, loss, frustration. To set the stage here for where we're going to go today, I'm going to read Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we might add in here, as he is. And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now there's a very unique situation. Three guys hanging on three crosses, sentenced to death. And in that moment, you have one fella who says, I don't believe you. If you are, prove it. And you have the other fella says, wow, please remember me. And by the way, he didn't do anything. What do we now know from that? We know one of those two guys on the cross knew enough to understand what Jesus represented and who he was. Now, what an attitude in this moment to say, please remember me, and then to have the Messiah say, surely you'll be with me today in heaven. Now, we have to ask, what is it we find in the presence of hope that hope 
is Jesus and what he did. Well, in the presence of hope, we find that God has come to meet us where we are. Three guys on crosses, two criminal, Jesus, the Messiah, and God has come to meet them where they are. Notice there was no, well, when this happens and if this is true and then you wind up over here, would you please give a good word for me? I'd like to be a part of that. There's no if, ands, or buts. There is, surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Look at that. Do you think that fellow found hope when Jesus responded to his request? What was that hope? Simply put, that hope was about all or nothing. It was about his recognition that there was something more than this life, this terrible death, and then all the things that might not be. Now let's ask ourselves a question. If you don't believe in God and you die and found out God's real, the Bible says there's a problem here. You didn't believe in me. But if you don't believe in God and you die and there is no God, no foul, no harm, no big deal. But what if you die and God is real? What if you die and what Jesus did on the cross is valid and real and mattered? You've lost everything if you don't come to that point of acknowledging God. Now, the one thing that is for sure today we're going to talk about how richly God is kind to us and gracious to us. Have you ever wondered of all the crosses, on all the hills, on all the days of the year, why that cross on that hill, on that month, on that day, and at that exact time? Why did this story unfold right there? It was a demonstration of God's plan unfolding and how it was going to interact with the world. Choose. Choose life. If you don't choose life, uh-oh. Some of us understand that... Uh, the uh oh is, okay, I'll have nothing to do with you since you rejected me. And uh, speaking of that, consider this. What is hell? Well, the Bible describes hell very, very specifically. But to understand it conceptually, it is this. Before I ever made the universe, the earth, the people, the sea, the sky, the stars, the moon, the sun, I put a plan into place to save your lives, your skins, your sinew, your soul, your spirit. And that plan is Jesus. Now, that being said, Let's look at that question briefly again. If you die and God doesn't exist, you've lost nothing. But if you die and God did exist, does exist, is existing, you've lost everything. Now, to, to relate to that, let's uh, consider another fact here. How do you live with your faith? We understand faith is given us by Christ. We understand belief 
is substantiated and pushed forward and expanded by Christ and the Holy Spirit. Did Jesus do the best he could do when he died? I'm going to tell you that's wrong. He did not do the best he could do. He did everything and gave all, even to the pouring out of his life. His best was not good enough. It wasn't about quality. It was about the all, the fulfilled, the completeness, the total and unconditional acceptance of his role to make sure that mankind was set free from sin, set free from the shackles of sin. Sin affects us sometimes in a very uh, unique way. It's like being shackled at the ankles and you can only take little baby steps and waddle like Charlie Chaplin and you're dragging a 16 pound bowling ball behind you and they just told you you have to swim across the lake. That's how sin can cripple us from time to time. Jesus gave his all. Yeah, he did a good job. But the point was his all. I can do the best I can do. And that doesn't include the mind, the heart, the soul, the body, the wishes, the desires. I can do the best job I can shoveling snow. I can do the best job I can encouraging my granddaughter and daughter to do something they've never done before. But I have a hard time understanding doing it completely to the point of pouring out my life even unto death. Now, the Bible is full of demonstrations of pouring out one's life even unto death. The Bible is also full of fulfillments and viewpoints of that very idea. In Mark 15, 25 through 28, we read, Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him, and the inscription of his accusation was written. The king of the Jews, with him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right, the other on the left. And so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, look at that. Way back there, we knew there was going to be somebody counted among the transgressors somebody who was going to pay this price. And that price was a heavy price. It was an exacting price. In Isaiah 53 and verse 12, we read, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Notice transgressors don't have except those, or if you, or when you. Notice that's not there. And he bore the sign, sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What an exacting statement. Today is all about that. It's about the fulfillment of that statement. Now consider that perhaps this was the first time these other men had an opportunity to experience the presence of God. The first recognition, when they needed him the most, where was he? He wasn't in Poughkeepsie or Biloxi. He was there with those men. 
right in the middle of them, not only metaphorically, but physically, in the middle of the issue, reaching out to them. How do you reach out? Yeah, I'll see you later today in paradise. One dying thief on the cross took advantage of God's closeness to him physically. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now let's flash ahead to Acts chapter 17, verses 26 through 28. And he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth. And has determined their pre-appointed times in the boundaries of their dwelling. So that they should seek the Lord and in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Might what? What is groping? What does it mean to grope? You ever seen a baby that's in mom's arms or dad's arms and it suddenly feels like it's going to fall and what they do? They grasp. Have you ever watched two kids playing with one toy and the other kid lunges and grasps for it? Groping is reaching out to connect to something physical and take control of it. It is to suddenly surge forward and grab. Do you get the feeling that groping is, wow, last ditch effort. We're at the high risk point, I need this. Look at this again. So that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are all, or are also his offspring. Now his offspring, what's that referring to? We understand that we are brought into the sonship and or daughtership of Jesus Christ, as Jesus is son to God, by that adoption that Jesus brought and delivered to us, we're also a part of that. And in that adoption, we are given privilege and we're also given opportunity. What is it we have to do to match that privilege and that opportunity? participate and be in what? A relationship. With who? With the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Now let's consider Isaiah 46 and part of verse 13 here. I bring my righteousness near, it should not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. What does that mean? I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. What does it mean to linger? To kind of hang out in one place and, yeah, when I think of lingering, I think more about loitering and somebody saying you can't stand in that doorway all day or, you're blocking traffic, would you move over there? Don't, don't loiter there. Lingering is hanging around. Lingering is sometimes hanging around to see what develops and what becomes available. Let's also look at Isaiah 51 and part of verse five. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth. Wow, gone forth. I know I've read about people going forth into battle. I've read about people going forth into other issues and matters. I've heard about people 
moving ahead in their lives and moving ahead in their troubles too, overcoming, challenging, and getting control back. You see, in the routine of your life and in the crisis of your life, God is always near to each one of you. But we understand he's not going to linger there a long time. What's the point of that? Choose. Choose what? Choose life. What life? The life saved as a son or daughter of God by invitation. Choose to participate. Choose to fellowship with. Choose to be in a functional life. Now, I can tell you, from my personal experience, this day, today, I can tell you that I would be willing, if it was asked of me, to put my body on the line for a friend, for a family member, but that's not the same as having done it. I can think of those terms in that all-in commitment and that ability to look at something and say, yes, I paid the penalty for that too. Oh, yes, I took care of that for you. Oh, well, yeah, you probably don't know this yet, but I even took care of that. What is that about, really? That is about peace, comfort. That's about a removal of guilt a removal of shame. It's about becoming more than a human. It's about becoming broader than just a person. It's about becoming the light on the hill. It's about becoming the encourager who brings people to meet the Holy Spirit and to meet Jesus. You know, the fact that we have the truth is good. But it's not the most important thing we have in certain moments. The most important thing we possess in certain moments is our story of what went wrong and how God took care of that. What happened that was so terrible and Jesus in the midst of it changed things in a crisis we hear this overwhelming instinct to do something, such as call your child and find out your child needs you desperately. And the Holy Spirit put that thought in your head. I've had that happen many times. I have it happen often. I realize that God is all around me. Now that brings us to a very important point. He is your hope in the midst of all that happens in life. God places himself there so that you may experience his salvation, his comfort, his love, and his passion for you. Now notice when Jesus was teaching and the guys that ran the city caught this woman in her uh, sexually immoral act, and they brought her before Jesus. They had two goals. One was to trip him up and cause him to lose face publicly. The other one was to see if he would abide with the laws and if he could be put on the spotlight and people could see him and see, oh, look, he didn't do what the scripture says. He didn't do what the teaching says. That's not what happened. When the woman was brought to Jesus, he basically got between her and her accusers. He took the focus off of her, put it on himself. And then what else did he do? He challenged their right to exercise authority. The person who had the authority to stone the woman was Jesus. 
And all of a sudden, they come to the point where these people who are accusing her leave. I've always found it fascinating that Jesus didn't say, you know me, you know the way you're forgiven, go. I've always found that fascinating. When Paul was in prison and various things happened, when people were brought to him and he talked with them, when doors were opened, when he went to a town where he had murdered people and he went there knowing someone was going to remember him, how was it he was able to get through all that? He knew there was the promise that comes through hope for his future. As Angie said a few weeks back, Jesus was stating his triumphal victory on the way into Jerusalem. Jesus was saying, look, I've already won this battle. But people didn't understand what that meant who didn't know him. Now, point number two here. In the presence of hope, we find that what? God accepts us just as we are and where we are. Now, what does as we are mean? Well, let's consider this. The thief hanging on the cross was still a thief when he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That thief was still a thief when he spoke those words. But he was no longer a thief when Jesus said to him, Today you will be with me in paradise. Did you catch that? When he asked for that blessing and was given the blessing promise, yeah, I'll see you in paradise later today. Got it covered. We look at that man and we still see a thief. But God didn't because... God gave Jesus for that very thing. Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Not tomorrow, not next week. While he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Why? Because there's a transformation that takes place in the presence of God. What hasn't been isn't what, or excuse me, what has not been isn't what always will be. If it hasn't existed before, and it does for you, it's not going to be permanent. What else? The despair and helplessness melts away in the presence of hope. Problems aren't going to be eternal. They're not going to be forever. You're not going to be buried in it. The despair and the helplessness melts away in the presence of hope. What is the hope? The hope is Jesus. The problems that confront our lives become possibilities, not sentences. You're not sentenced to a critical issue. You are actually sentenced to participate in an opportunity. The fear that sometimes grips us melts into fortitude and strength in the presence of God. I don't know what else to do. I'm going to grope around and see if I can find God's vision for me. And I'm going to connect with it. And I'm going to be right here. And I'm not moving until I see your face and I meet you. I'm not going to turn away and go somewhere else until I get to look in your eyes. I'm parked and I'm standing right here. What is that? That is a life becoming filled with the possibility, not a sentence. 
And that is because of hope, and that is the hope that Jesus is. The filth of sin is washed away in the hope found new in the presence of Jesus. Now, how do you describe the presence of Jesus? Eileen would tell you it is when you're taking care of somebody who's dying of ravaging cancer and you look at their face and they're basically in a coma and you say, okay, this is where we are now. I'm going to let go of your hand. And they open their eyes and they sit up and they do that. That shows that there is something behind the scenes. There is something going on that is in the greater creation. I've got to witness that while Eileen was doing her job several times. And it makes the hair stand up in the back of your neck and your arms. It makes you feel like you're in a supernatural place because that is the way we are made. That is the way it's meant to be. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10, it says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, the prostitutes, the homosexuals, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkard, the slanderers, the swindlers, none of them will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean to inherit? What is inheriting? It is receiving what has been given to you by appointment. We tend to think of mom or dad or grandma and grandpa left this to me. But inheritance is literally absorbing and taking in and taking on what is passed to you from someone who's a dear friend, a neighbor, a family member. That kind of inheritance is important. And that is what some of you were, those slanderers, those idolaters, those immorals, those people. Some of us were there. Some of us were not as God wanted us to be in their, our lives. One of the things that I found fascinating is that what I witnessed years ago and did not understand has been made so clear that it now makes me sit up and take notice. Here's an example of that. Curtis and I, when we first met, we were talking and we started to share a little bit about our war stories, warring against an evil spirit in this world that we live in. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, this guy's got some experiences I don't have and I can't wait to ask him about it. We have others now who are having these experiences and these experiences inform the whole family just as what Jesus did on the cross informs the family of man. Curtis's experiences inform us. It comes out in teaching time when he's doing Bible study. Just as Dave and Barry were teachers helping young people, just as they did that, that experience informed the rest of their life in a way that it's pretty easy to guess when you first meet them what they did for work. It comes out as part of their DNA and part of who they are. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a what? New creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Wait a minute, that's gone way past the line into meddling now. Meddling with what? 
with our lives. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, and old things have passed away. You remember the story? Don't put new wine in old wine skins. It doesn't work. Well, the old passed away. What does past mean? It means you've gone by it. It means back then on a different calendar and a different year and a different month. It means of the past. Let's talk about part three. In the presence of hope, we find that what? God will save anyone who calls upon him. And calls upon him and does what? Accepts and obeys. What is the obedience that, that Jesus is wanting? What is that obedience? What does it look like? Basically, love God with all your mind, your heart, your body, your soul, and love your fellow man. In general, that is the relationship. In the presence of God, we find that God will save anyone who calls upon him. Two thieves hung on the cross. The one thief asked Jesus to remember him, and he was saved. What was he saved from? Was he saved from death? No. Was he saved from torturous death? No. What was he saved from? Sin. Sin that would rob him of his future and rob him of peace and understanding. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Remember, that also can point at that he may not always be here hanging around. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon What's a pardon? Oh, excuse me. Um, I didn't mean to burp. Um, pardon me. Good. Now it's just like it was before I did that. Let's continue on. Pardon. For our God will abundantly pardon. I've been pardoned so many times I, I can't remember. I've been pardoned in many ways. Sometimes I'm pardoned so simply that it is absolutely exhilarating to see it. For instance, the fact that somebody finds a wonderful boyfriend and they're beginning to talk about, well, what do we want to be doing in five years? Oh, okay, well then let's sit down and talk about what marriage is. I've been pardoned watching my daughter and my granddaughter. I've been pardoned from the critical idea and the notion that I can pick someone better for you than you can pick. Boy, them words get you in all kinds of trouble. I've had to be pardoned from that more than once. But the point is, now, I know a way to influence that without my words. My words are aimed at Jesus, aimed at the Holy Spirit and God, and they get in where needed and alter the situation for my view of my family. Now notice here. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And the Lord will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That other thief knew who Jesus was, never asked him for salvation, and because of his decisions, right now, today, crying out for mercy, in what? The person didn't choose Christ, didn't choose to be accepted into the family, didn't choose to participate 
didn't want to start any kind of a re uh, relationship with that moment that Jesus was offering. So where is that person? What have we been taught? What does society say happened to him since he rejected God? Lost. Lost. Where? The common thinking is hell. What is hell? I'll tell you what it is. It's very simple. God was great to the point of providing for every single need a human could have. Even if the human ignored God, turned his back on God, spit at the feet of Jesus, cursed him, and walked away from the Holy Spirit. God even gave a place for those people who did not choose Jesus. And that place, some call it hell, but God was all-encompassing. When he put a plan together and put a solution in place through his son, that also include, if you don't want me, I got a place for you right over here. Just go that way. God in his wisdom accounted for that too. So we have one thief who accepts Jesus and is saved, and we have another that winds up in a bad way. What about the routine of our lives? How many of us live in daily torment? How many of us have dealt with a dying mate, a dying friend, a dying family, a baby, a coworker? How many of us have had torment over the fear that something could happen? Um, an example. Friends had a car accident some months back. I remember my car accident, and I wondered if they had the same desire to check three times as often watching your mirrors and behind you to know where everybody is. It was that feeling of overwhelming doom. I got to pay more attention here. Well, you know what? Our friends haven't been in another car accident since. And I don't see any signs of them living with the torment of that accident hanging over their head, making them fearful. That's not something that we see in them now. How many of us live in torment, living as though there's no hope at all? When all we have to do is call on Jesus and be delivered? It amazes me that some will willfully disown God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, but they'll claim the blessings that people want. Just like God made the rain to rain on the just and the unjust man, the air allows both the just and the unjust man to breathe. The carrots that grow go to good people, bad people. Just like that, there are some people who say, well, I want to go and hear the music, or I want to go and see this, or I want to go on that trip and do that, but don't ask me to believe and participate. Participating is the easiest thing you could do to acknowledge God and participate with him. Uh, participating in that relationship, it's not about accuracy. It's not about transactions. I'll do this, God, you do that and repay me. That's not it. The relationship is about receiving blessing, sharing blessing, sharing encouragement, sharing hope. You see, here's the big thing. Who knows what we are explicitly when it comes to Jesus? Who knows what we are as individuals when it comes to Jesus? I'll tell you what it is. You and you and you and you are the only image bearers of Christ someone's going to meet on a certain day. You're the image bearer of his reputation, of his love. You're the image bearer of his compassion and his grace. You're the image bearer 
that can trigger the, I might be able to do this if I get your help. You trigger that reaction. You're the person who might trigger the response. I, I, I don't know, I met this person and I'm gonna call them and see if they can help me with this. That image you bear that is Jesus, his image, that is put in our hands on purpose. It is put there for a reason. Salvation isn't something the believer will get. Salvation is something the believer what? Salvation is something they possess. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And this one's really important. Do you live your life in possession of your salvation, your faith, your belief as a renter or as an owner? Do you rent your salvation and your faith or do you own it? Do you know what it looks like when somebody rents their salvation and they approach their life as a renter? not as an owner. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So if he was tempted as we are, could we say he suffered like... We suffer sometimes, even worse, but he suffered as we would if we were hanging there on that cross. Can we understand that? For we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What does it mean to help? Now, I'm not talking about helping yourself to the second bag of M&Ms in the cupboard. That's not the kind of self-help we're talking about. What does it mean to help in the context of Jesus and grace? Good Samaritan, helping someone else. Looking out for someone. Help goes out from one away from them. There's the do-it-yourself mentality. There's the help others mentality. You know, there's some things we need to do ourselves, but we still need to be talking to God about what those are. We still need to be relating to him when it comes to what he wants us to do with what he gives us. But in general, that help is centered around a time of need. Now, let's look at a conclusion here. Lent, Easter, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection are all about salvation. Easter is about God so loving you that he did something. He did everything within his power to reach out to each one of us with the message of salvation. Where does that leave us? Where does the fact that Jesus voluntarily said, I will go do this, he participated in the Father's plan. Where does that leave us when we consider that prophecy was fulfilled when he was buried and the stone was rolled in front of the tomb? Where does that leave us when we consider his resurrection and his ascension and his being on high with the Father right now? I'm going to tell you. It leaves you able to say something very profound. 
Father, forgive my sins and trespasses. Accept my sins and trespasses and allow me to receive forgiveness. We stand in a time on this world where we can actually talk to people. We can relate to them because of what Jesus did. Jesus, please accept their sins and allow them to find peace through this time. You see, we can actually go and say, God, take them. I don't want them. No. Why? Because we're made pure and clean. Why? Because we're forgiven. Don't ever be duped by performance-based religion. It is not about memorizing scriptures in volume. It's not about giving offering in volume. It's not about singing and praising in volume. It's about doing those things in a way that has meaning, not a transaction. Just as the prodigal son came home to a loving father who received him and put him on a pedestal, that young man understood what forgiveness was, what salvation and grace was when that came from his father. That father violated every Middle Eastern cultural rule that existed. When he pulled up his robe and the hem of his garment came up, he was committing one of the most egregious cultural sins you could commit, running down that driveway towards a wayward son who was an infidel to his family and his society. And here's dad trucking down the driveway with his calves exposed, running just madly to get to his son. That's where we stand. We stand right there being asked into relationship. We have the ability to say, Father, forgive my sins and take them from me. And to know what that means. We have the ability to explain that and share that with others. When someone says being a Christian is a lot of hard work, I will tell you that is true until the Holy Spirit alters your heart. Once your heart is altered, what we do is easy because of what Jesus gives us. So, remember... What God put in place for us through Jesus is not only profound, but it is one of a kind. What Jesus did was not only profound, it was one of a kind as well. And what God had Jesus do was to pour out his everything, his all. To pour out even his blood, even to the point of death. So that we are, not can be, we are forgiven, we are saved, we are wanted, we are his children. Let's ask a prayer here. I'm going to pray for the meal and then we're going to have Miss Phyllis take us down the road of prayer here for a few minutes. Thank you, God, for giving us this weekend. We're grateful that we were able to take our, our skills and our time down to Tacoma and help in Larry's church. We're grateful that you have put people there who still want you and need you, and that even in their old age, they're functional and they're well uh, aware of who you are and the time of year this is. Bless Larry and Donna. It's very taxing to be so sick and be the mate of someone like that. Be with her. We honor her as the wife of that family. We thank you now for the food, the meal you've put here, for the hands that prepare it, the persons who took the time to go get it, to set everything up and to make it look nice. We offer up our grateful thanks and our resounding, we love you, Lord, we love you, God, we love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.